Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so far that we have recognised your presence amongst us this morning. And Lord, as we look at your word, I ask, Lord, that you help us to recognise your presence in that as well. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to continue on with Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 29. We're going to have a bit of uh, imaginational, playful fun with it this morning, okay? I, you know when they say, um, when they're uh, doing true life stories in movies and they use a bit of uh, uh, poetic license, as they call it, yeah? Or artistic license. We're going to have a little bit of that this morning. You up for that? Yes. Are you up for that? Yes. Jonathan is. Anyway, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for coming here this morning. Anyway, let's try and do a quick recap. This is Mark. Uh, Mark, as we know, is quite the fast-paced uh, gospel with a, a secrecy motif in it. It always seems to be lots of battles going on. And uh, Mark is also just uh, got that sense of, yes, and next, and next, and next, and next. And we so far discovered that the disciples, as per usual, still haven't quite got it yet. But we last left off way last year, which was a very long time ago. Uh, the moment on the transfiguration where Jesus is turned into dazzling white. Yes? As in his clothing is, is bleached better than any known biological liquid can do today. And we got Peter who does that bumbling statement of, oh, it's really good, Moses and Elijah here, let's build some tents. <sighs> and we looked at that and realised, well, on one level, yes, he panicked, because he didn't know what else to say. But on another level, it was okay, because they were expecting God to come and tabernacle, dwell with them, be with them. So you can understand his statement, yes? Do you remember that? Marvellous. And we related and we recognise that Mark is also trying to show us that, that where Moses went up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, that this is that sort of thing. Jesus is better than Moses and goes up to the mountain. And there is a greater revelation shown. So let's read the whole of the verses and then we'll take it from there. I've obviously had to come down the mountain. So when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them. And some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the father's boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if 
a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. If you're feeling a moment of deja vu, about an hour ago, yeah? When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out, sorry, can be cast out only by prayer. Some manuscripts at the end there say prayer or fasting. We'll come to that later on. But if most people are honest, when they come to that last line, they go, what did Jesus mean by that? Yeah? There's nozzings of heads. We'll come to that later. Anyway, clearly what goes up must come down. So Jesus has been up the mountain. Clearly he's got to come back down again. And he walked straight into an argument between the disciples and the Jewish teachers of religious law and probably just everybody else that are onlookers. And we know what the argument is about. That's between verses 17 and 18. So we have a blaming of an evil spirit for the boy's condition. The condition is actually the symptoms, really, of epilepsy. Most commentators will say it is an epileptic fit that the boy is having. And the story, if you're not sure, is retold in Matthew 17 and Luke chapter 9. Not as depth and as extensively as it is in Mark. And the symptoms, though, are the same. And as I said now, wonderful society, it's been defined as uh, an epileptic fit. And we would, in our wonderful society here, of rational science has the answer thinking, would just turn around and just say, oh yeah, treatment for epilepsy, that's what's required there. But you have a father here who says, no, 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 this is my son. He is possessed by an evil spirit and the symptoms are therefore not due to a sudden burst of intense electrical activity in the brain, but it's due to an evil being residing in my boy. So the father wants Jesus to cast out the demon. Jesus is up a mountain. Father asks the disciples who are down the mountain. So let's just take a moment. Can you imagine, just for a minute? You're one of the nine disciples left down on the bottom of the mountain. And a man comes up to you and says, uh, Are you one of the disciples of the Rabbi Jesus? And your answer is? Yes. Great, he says. Here is my son. He has a demon inside. Are you able to cast him out? And you answer? Yeah, slightly less lessies there, wasn't there? <laughs> Thought there would be. Some will go, what? No, 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 hang on a minute. <laughs> just, 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 just hang on. No, no, no. You, it, it'll be down later. Seriously, I know it's a bit like Moses. It took about 40 days and 40 nights, but it'll be down later. Can you hang around for a bit? Some of the disciples, and I think all nine... As I said, this is a bit of poetic license here, a bit of artistic license. But I think they sort of went, yeah, no worries. We did this back in chapter six. We cast out demons. We got sent out as the 12 by Jesus. We did healings, preached on the streets, took hospitality from only those that would give us us. We did that. No problem. Roll up the sleeves. Excuse me, lads. This one's mine.
Ah, you laugh. But could you imagine? They've got the teachers of religious law around them. They've got the people sent from, uh, by the Sanhedrin to, uh, to effectively to go and get evidence against Jesus. So that's why they're milling around. That's why they're around. And you've got this crowd of people. So you can almost imagine that the disciples are in this deep debate with these teachers of religious law already. And they're probably doing some good stuff. And then this bloke turns up with his son, pray for him. And they're thinking, right, we're going to show uh, this, this lot from uh, at the temple. We'll give them a few uh, what's it now. We'll show that this Jesus is real. We can do this and start saying things in the name of Jesus and doing all the things that they've done before. And then nothing happens. Now put yourself there for a minute. I think the first thing I'll be doing is going, all my life nothing's happened. Do I look like an idiot or what? Anybody can relate to that? Not that I'm an idiot, but (laughs) relate. But I think some of us relate to that even before we get to the point of even praying for someone or even offering to do it. What if it doesn't work? I'm going to look foolish. So guess what? I won't offer because I'll look foolish. So then nothing happens at all then because I've decided not to engage in this whatever it is, demonic, healing, whatever. So actually nothing has happened already. But imagine just for a moment, if those disciples had decided to do that, then nothing would have happened. And we wouldn't have the story in the gospel and we wouldn't learn from it. But they did step out in in a sense of boldness, in the sense of, well, we've done this before. And we've done it without Jesus with us because we got sent out in twos. And look, there's nine of us. This will be all right. Nothing happens. So, they start arguing with the teachers of religious law. So what do you think they're arguing about? What do you think the disciples and the teachers of religious law, what do you think they were actually arguing about? Because, you know, it's not much of an argument, really, is it? Well, nothing happened. No, you're right, it didn't. So what do you think the argument was? Get your imaginations. It's okay to be, just to speculate and just to throw it up there. By the way, that's a good Jewish way of reading the... uh, 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 biblical stuff, it's a good Jesuit way of doing it as well. So allow your, your imagination to run. The teachers probably will be asking the disciples, how come you can cast out these demons? You were with Jesus, right? What's happening now? Is it not? Why can't you? Yeah, why can't you? These are made up stories. That's why you can't do it. And it didn't really happen at all elsewhere. You organised for people to make it look like you did it. This Jesus is a magician, a charlatan. Yeah? Come on, that's what I mean. Get your imagines going. Imagine what it was like today if you went and did that. What would be the comments and the answers you'd get back? This Jesus is not... Real. Said to you, these uh, teachers of religious law, they were sent by the sort of the judges, the council of various cities of the Sanhedrin, as they're known as, from within the Old Testament. And they were sent to gain evidence against Jesus. So you could imagine for them, 
the part of their thing is, by what authority are you casting out these demons? What makes you think you can do all this sort of stuff? You know, this Jesus is not an approved rabbi of us lot. By what authority do you think you can do this? So, of course, then when it doesn't happen, they went, ha, ha, there is no authority. We expect Jesus a minute to pull out a bunch of flowers because he's such a magician, rather than doing anything real. Do you see the... So I can imagine the disciples and they're really arguing, going, no, 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 but we saw this and this and this and this happen. Well, that's only when Jesus was around. He ain't here. A modern day argument, I mean, it might be people saying, what authority and what right do you have to come and tell me about Jesus? What right do you have to come and tell me that what I believe is wrong and what you believe is right? That'd be a modern day argument, because where's the power to back up what you're saying? Anyway, Jesus arrives on the scene. There should be a yay. Jesus arrives on the scene. Well, could you imagine the disciples? <sighs> Lads, he's arrived. All yours! <laughs> he gets the answer as to why they're arguing. He now understands why they're arguing. And of course, verse 19, Jesus' response is so gentle and mild and understanding, isn't it? Shall we go through it again? And then Jesus said to them, you faithless people. I mean, that's gentle, isn't it? How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, there's an argument in all the commentaries about, was Jesus just talking to the crowd? Was he just talking to the disciples when he told them faithless people? Or was he talking to everyone? And in the NLT, you says it, you'll note it just says, Jesus said to them. And at the footnote, it said, uh, or said to his disciples. But actually, as the argument goes across, even the rest of the story... And there's a certain way, I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but into the way that some of the Greek terms that are used here, I actually prefer the argument that he was purely talking to the crowd, not the disciples. What does that for me is at the end of it, when he's giving them that teaching, when they ask him the question, why couldn't we do it? Well, let me instruct you. So he's telling the crowd off, because by this point, he's done enough to surely prove his authority of somebody sent by God, yes? And yet, there's arguments always going on. Anyway, Jesus' compassion holds and he asks for the boy. And as the boy is approached, the evil spirit reacts to Jesus' presence. Well, you see, in the whole of the Gospels, that's nothing unusual, is it? When darkness comes into the presence of light, strangely enough, it reacts quite violently and badly. <coughs> Verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been happening? I have a question for you. Why do you think Jesus asked that question? What do you think Jesus even engaged in that question with the Father? Maybe to show that this was a deep-seated issue that had been around a long time, not just some trivial thing that will go away tomorrow anyway if you leave it alone. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah, got it. Yeah, trying to unpack the fact this, is, this has been literally since the child was... Uh, 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 since a little child. Anything else? It does suggest that he was unimpressed with the demon's performance. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what I like about Kevin. Well done. Yes. Any else? <coughs> Sure, you know how long this has been happening, but just to engage the father as well. Ah, to engage the father. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm your leadership team, so I'm going to push a bit further. What do you mean by that? Um, just to try and engage him in the sense that if you can, whatever makes you bring this child here right now to my disciples, you're on a journey and um, let's walk together. Yeah, personal interest. If you remember throughout the whole of Mark, Mark shows how Jesus engages personally with the purpose. Sometimes takes somebody away from the crowd to engage in healing them. And that is an act of him saying, I, Jesus, am concerned about you. You personally. You right now. You. I'm not worried about showboating on a stage in front of everybody. It is you that I'm interested in. You need to know that. I have a personal interest in you, the person. And that's still the same today. He's engaging with the Father. Now, I want to take it, because that's part of the thing for me. Everything else was absolutely you know, good and proper. The deep-seatedness, and I want to, we're going to chat about that in a moment. But I just want you for a moment to think as a parent, if you're able to, to think as a parent of the daily trauma that this Father has been going through. Daily. Since the day that this has happened to his son... Note the trauma he will be going through daily. He'll never know, is this the day that the evil spirit wins and chucks my son into a fire and kills him? Just put it there. How much that father couldn't have slept at night. Imagine the times that the father has gone to various healers and exercisers to get his son free. Imagine the stress, the hope he had that maybe today is the day my son will be released. And it hasn't happened. It gets to you after a while, doesn't it? You start to lose hope. It's so easy to focus on the miracle and not say the Father. And this Father's heard about this Jesus. He might have even witnessed previously some of Jesus' abilities and miracles that Jesus has done. So imagine now that you are the Father. So come on. So you're going, right, I'm going to take my son to see this Jesus. You get to where he's meant to be, he's not there. The disciples are. Oh, blow, second best. Yeah? It's almost like a, a hospital equivalent, isn't it? Right, I'm going to go and see the professor consultant for my thing. Oh, blow it, I've got to actually have one of his team, who right away is just as good. Yeah, it's the same equivalent, yeah? Oh, look, there's a few, look, I can see a few. Yeah, 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 okay. So he almost starts, his hope starts waning, and he thinks, no, 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 it's okay. These disciples, they can do it. Apparently, we've heard, they've gone round towns and streets. They've done it as well. So you've got that glimmer of hope, and it doesn't happen. Imagine your mind at that moment, tossing and turning between, I do believe, I don't believe. And then Jesus arrives. Oh, glimmer of hope reopens again. And he says to Jesus, after Jesus asked, how long has this been happening? Since he was a little boy. Have mercy on us and help us 
and you can understand the next three words. If you can. This father, this, this everyday man, his hope is almost zero. So you can imagine, well, you might be able to help us, but everyone else has failed, so I'm not expecting too much, really. Ever been there? And also this statement, since there's a boy, there is a, a point of this fact this is long term. This isn't the boy's fault that he's demon possessed. He's not dealt in the occult. He personally hasn't opened himself up to this evil spirit. So you can imagine, as the father, he's probably sitting there blaming himself. And he might well have something to do with it. So as a father, he's saying, this is my fault. As a dad myself... There are things when, you know, when you're learning to be a dad and your child's a baby and, you know, you, there's certain things when they fall over, you think, that's my fault, I should have been there. So imagine this dad, demon-possessed boy, he's definitely going to be going, this is my fault. His ostracization from his community. Trust me, his community would have had him over here. I mean, most of them didn't go near Ill, Ill people. There's no way you're going to go near somebody who's demon-possessed, are you? So you can imagine, have mercy on us. Notice that. It's not just have mercy on my boy. It's have mercy on us. And help us if you can. Jesus' response. What do you mean, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. One of the most difficult lines, because we then sit with that deep sense of, great, I believe, therefore then God's going to do it. So, to be totally ridiculous just for a moment, I believe and I pray every day that I'm going to have a Ferrari sitting outside the front of my house. <laughs> Do you get a funny... F <laughs> <laughs> well done, Jane. That was brilliant. <laughs> I believe. Come on, let me pray every day. I believe Jesus will provide. Please. Honestly, Lord, I will lend it to other people to, for them to use. Ahem. <clears throat> That's the problem. We have to be very careful that we do not take that line and just assume, as long as I believe hard enough, God's going to give me what I want. Everything is always done in the accordance with God's will. But we can discover God's will, and we're going to discuss that a bit later on in the story. But you can understand then this father instantly, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. It's a tossing wave moment. Anybody had that in their walk with God? Stick your hands in the air like you just don't care. Right? It's true. Come on. We have our moments of doubt. Because we're not seeing the answer today. Today. 
That's our credit card society thinking, by the way. God's got his little do- doofer machine. I call it a doofer, by the way. It's amazing. Amazing how um, uh, waiters and waitresses, they understand you when you say, can you bring your doofer? They understand what I mean. I mean, the credit card machine. <laughs> don't know. I've always called it a doofer. Don't ask me why. But we almost treat God like that sometimes. Well, that's all right. Uh, God, just bring the doofer over. I swipe the credit card. Done and dusted. Thank you very much. You're going to answer my prayer. It's going to be sorted now. God doesn't work that way. But you can understand the I do believe, but I'm struggling. Help me with my unbelief. Actually answer this one, please, now. It's like earlier on in, during the worship time when when, when Carol stood up and had that word about the fact that it's absolutely true, you know, that, 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 that sometimes it takes time, it takes persistence. And we don't like that because we don't like living in the middle of what is going on. But sometimes we have to go through that to learn something about ourselves and about how God operates, for want of a better phrasing. And also what I like about this was actually to to, to relate for once in my life to something that my wife even said at the beginning. There was no loud music going on, was there? There was no, he has to be a particular way. It was just belief. But help me with my unbelief. And it's okay to say to God, I do believe but help me with my unbelief. He copes with that, strangely enough. Anyway, verses 25 to 27, I will re-repeat them, but they're fairly self-explanatory. So when Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers were growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. I think the point of that is that Jesus saw that the crowd was starting to crowd around him, and he's thinking, right, let's get this sorted before it gets too big, because this will start turning into a show. Jesus doesn't do shows, by the way. And he rebuked the evil spirit. So, listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and unable to speak. Could you not imagine that? This, this, this child not only has these fits, he's nearly trying to be killed by this evil spirit, but he can't ever communicate it or he can't hear what's going on. This is seriously somebody who's he's bound in bondage. He's chained, completely chained. And then Jesus commands, come out of the child and never enter him again. So this is not just come on out. This is coming out. And by the way, the doors on this child are now locked. You are never to re-enter him ever again. Completely set free. And at this point, there should be an amen. And then again, the spirit screamed, threw the boy into a yet another violent convulsion and left him. And the boy appeared to be dead. I think you would be at that point, wouldn't you? I think the physical manifestation of this spirit coming out, the physical body, I think, would not have coped very well at that moment, do you? And typical, the crowd start going, he's dead. He's dead. Well, this Jesus didn't do a very good job, did he? He's dead. No, 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 you laugh. But the outcome is not what you expect. Sometimes when God works, the outcome is not what we expected. We pray for something and we expect God to do it the way we want it done. Hate to tell you this, it doesn't work like that with God. He does it his way because he knows best. As painful as it is, and as time-consuming as it can be, God does know what he's doing. So you can imagine this faithless crowd, this unbelieving crowd. Oh, well, he's dead now. It really has gone to pot, hasn't it? That didn't work very well, did it? But then Jesus, again, showing that personal touch, goes up and takes the boy by the hand and helps him to stand up. 
Again, personal connection. This is a point my imagination would like to run wild, just ever so slightly. We're not quite sure how old the boy or the child really is. But I do wonder if for the first time after he stood up and he tried to open his mouth and speak, all the noises of the murmuring crowd he could hear. Because his ears have now been unblocked. Imagine that experience for the very first time for that child to suddenly realise, I can hear. I do wonder if he went, oh my life, the noise is too much. Notice that Mark does not record the reaction of the crowd. What would your reaction be if that happened here this morning at Greenford Baptist Church? And how long would that hallelujah carry on for? 24 hours? 48 hours? By about Wednesday, the excitement starts to wane. Something else comes along. So the hope in Jesus starts to wane again. Just an interesting thought for all of us. I'm not nagging anyone. It's just we live in the real world. We know what we're like. Anyway, so the disciples, they go off. Afterwards, they say in verse 28, Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples. They asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can only be, ca can only be cast out by prayer. Now, it says prayer and fasting in some manuscripts, in the old manuscripts. Some of it says prayer and fasting. But they're the later manuscripts. They're the later copies that have been copied. And here's a bit of a shock if you're not aware of this already. Um, that it is recognised that there were at times that the early church, not just the church, not the church in Acts, but the early church in its first few centuries, occasionally added a <clears throat> couple of things every now and again in when they're transcribing. Which you can understand, they're doing most of it by candlelight, and they sometimes did that. And so when you look at the later manuscripts, you think, well, that says I'm fasting. But the earlier manuscripts, which are dated, and we know they're much earlier, they do not have that. So it would have been just by prayer. And you'll know now in modern translations, most of them just put and prayer. Oh, sorry, prayer and full stop. They just put a footnote at the bottom to say and fasting. The modern translations we have today, the, 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 the sort of later publications, what we have today is probably the most accurate you're ever going to get at the moment. So don't sit there and think, oh, there's something wrong with the Bible. No, there isn't. That's why we have these footnotes, because we're honest about the fact that there is sometimes a bit of confusion as to what was actually said. Okay? We recognise that this comes through human hand, divine inspired human hand, as it says in Timothy, yes? So we're quite honest about how this comes about. I mean, that's we as Christians are honest. So I go with the fact that it means only prayer. And that's really helpful if you're somebody who doesn't do fasting very well. I clearly do it really well. <laughs> but in all honesty, when you look at it, I would suggest it just says, uh, just prayer. But still, nonetheless, you look and you think, what did he mean? That makes no sense. Because you don't see Jesus praying, did you, in the whole of that narrative? Did you? Did, did Jesus suddenly go, back in a minute, need to go and pray? Lord, Heavenly Father, I want to know right now, in the name of Jesus, what I should be doing for this boy. Thank you. I'm on. Right, sorted. I know what to do now. Did he? Did you hear me over the speaker at all? That's all right, that's good, it worked. Oh, that's all right. Thanks very much. I had these moments. Shoelaces come undone. I nearly fell down the stairs. Right. You might have heard a few words that I didn't want you to hear. No, moving on. What did he mean? Well, in one of the commentaries, and actually I have to be honest with you, when you read the commentaries, 
even they turn around and go, well, you feel like, can you just leave it with a sense of, we're not 100% sure. <laughs> but I think when you read the, the, uh, the, the narrative in its completeness, when you take into account, I would took into account chapter 6, I, I think there's some answers to this. First and foremost, boy, I do need to go back swimming. <laughs> do you remember when I said about my shoulders last year? Remember I was on that strong painkiller and I couldn't move? I haven't been able to go swimming properly since. But uh, we're going on Monday, tomorrow morning. Edward states, the present passage also introduces prayer in the context of faith, connecting it with spiritual power. Both faith and prayer testify that spiritual power is not in one's self, but in God alone. This is the problem. I think what means here is actually... It's a sense of, you didn't dig into God. That's why you couldn't do it. Remember I said earlier on, the disciples in chapter 6 had done it already. Cast out demons. We know that they went out and they came back astonished at what they had done. It records it in Matthew, where they're absolutely amazed of how the demons obeyed their very commands and he said actually Jesus said, don't rejoice in that rejoice in the fact that your name is written in the book of life again slight poetic license but you have you ever do you remember last week Bola was talking about taking a risk for God stepping out yeah being uncomfortable funny enough when we're uncomfortable who do we rely upon the most when you're in a situation to which you've never done before and you're not comfortable, who do you rely upon the most? Yeah, I agree with you, Lord. Who do you rely upon the most? God. Well, I hope so. Or do you rely upon your credit card? <laughs> or do you rely upon a boss? No. You rely upon God. When you find yourself in a really sticky situation, I remember the very first time I, I preached, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, I spent ages talking to God, praying. When I went to Nepal, I remember, absolutely, I am in a context I do not understand. I'm in a place I do not understand. I haven't got my church family around me. It's me and one other bloke who I only met a couple of months ago. On my Jack Jones. And if you don't understand what that means, come and see me later on. It means on your own. That's it. Me. Oh, my life. People are going to be looking at me as their teacher. I'm going to be taken out to villages to go and pray for people. The scariest one was, sorry, you're going to get a bit of a te pestle testimony. One of the biggest scariest ones, tons of them, but this one stuck to my mind the most because it was a real amazing, was you're going to go and preach what is effectively at a Wednesday fellowship in the middle of a mud hut, in the middle of a village. Come and speak. Lord, I haven't got a clue. What do I say to these people? Well, you use this, you use this passage, you use Ephesians 2.10. Tell them how much they're my masterpiece, how much I can still make use of them. They're wonderful and they need to come to know me. Okay, I'll do that then, Lord. Being translated in Nepalese for me, fantastic. Du, 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 du. Yeah, next minute, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Turns up. People give their life to Christ. Not because of who I am, but because I'm just there. And other things. What did I do? Rested in God. Relied on him heavily. Prayed a lot in advance. Here's an element for me that actually what the disciples did were complacent. Been here before. Ah, oh, we've done this before. Don't need to talk to God. Done this all before. Ever been like that? And then what happens? Wham! A situation goes left field on you that you didn't expect. Who's ever gone into a work meeting thinking, yeah, as usual, Monday morning meeting, setting up for the week. 
usual junk, here we go, sit down, we go through the motions, and then somebody in the meeting gives you a curveball statement. Yeah? And then you suddenly find your mind going <laughs> Bit of complacency. These demons look all the same to us. Okay, sorry, I know it's a bit... I did say there's going to be a bit of artistic license this morning. But it's like coming to church on a Sunday morning. Oh, this church always looks the same to me. Same orange chairs. Same faces. All beautiful. <laughs> May not include myself 100% in that. But same building, the coffee's the same. <sighs> really must invest in a filter coffee. But you can turn up at this building saying it's always all the same. And forget the very presence of God and who you should be resting in. And I think that's part of this. This kind can be cast out only by prayer. They were there. They weren't relying on God internally. They were almost going through the motions. It's almost like, again, sorry, same thing. You could lead worship up here and you could go through the entire motion from Sunday straight to the end, sing the songs, do the offering, a bit of prayer ministry. I, I, I could lay you out the agenda quite nicely. Really could. But when Jesus was there, not only was he asking the Father, he was engaging in discerning what is this about? What is going on here? Just because the Father said it was a de demon that's doing it, doesn't mean it was. In our rational thinking, we could just turn around and say, well, that's just epilepsy. But actually, the cause of this, these fits was demonic. And you need to engage in prayer with God to ask God, God, what's going on here? Give me the right cure, inverted commas. Is this purely somebody's unwell, as in it's just a medical thing? Or is there a demonic force behind this? And engaging in that, in prayerful conversation with God. I remember a quote many, many, many years ago by one Mr. Andrew Robertson. Do you know, over here, I could do without God for about three or four days. We can live without God for three or four days. In our heads, because we have everything, we can live without relying on God three to four days. So we believe the next breath you're about to take, God supplied. The next breath... God supplied. The few that I had to take running up and down those stairs, God really supplied. <laughs> the point being, here in this moment, we have to be alert, actively engaged with God all of the time to say what is happening here. What is going on in this situation? You could be having an argument with your next door neighbour or with one of your relatives or with somebody in the household. And it could be so trivial... And you're thinking, this is really becoming disproportionate. They're seeing this in a really weird way. What's going on? And then you have to ask yourself the question, Lord, what's really going on here? What is behind this? Now, it's not all demonic, hear me carefully. But nonetheless, we have to be engaged in that in times. So, the teaching for this morning is... Let's not be complacent. Let us be faithfully relying upon our God on a daily basis, engaging with him into what's going on.
it's digging deeper. Not because you have to be holier than thou. Not because you've had the right music on that morning or you've read your Bible that morning. But because we can and we should. Because we need him every day. Amen? Amen? Take you a few moments to pray and talk to God for yourself. Lord, Heavenly Father, recognise that if we want to see you move in our society, move in our lives, then we have to have the faith to believe. Lord, I ask for those of us who are struggling with that faith, struggling with that belief, the cry of that father, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Lord, answer that. But Lord, connected with that faith, with that belief, Lord, I recognise that we have to recognise that we have to be people of prayer, people of engaging in conversation with you, engaging in listening to you, engaging in it on a regular basis in our daily walks. Help us be people who are engaging with the creator and sustainer of the universe who takes a personal interest in us. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.